Let's provide some position preview updates up next on a Kokomo Friday. Alcantara, Soroka, you look so good in polka. Peralta, Manoa, Basak, Ferrer, and Nola. Chilito, Castillo, Yoshida, Wilson, Sinto, Carlo, and Fado. Value so high, but any piece so low. Frank loves tips of Connor Joe. Now let's get on with the show. Hey! Happy Kokomo Friday and welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on March 15th. I wrote March 16th on my rundown. That is not correct. It is March 15th. I am Frank Stanfield, joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today on our show, position preview updates. What does that mean? Well, we did our position previews way back in February. A lot has changed since then. We'll get you caught up on everything that has happened, and hopefully this will act as a a nice little cram session for everyone getting ready to draft. I know some big drafts are happening this weekend. I've got a home league draft coming up. Tout Wars on Saturday. So lots going on. We will hopefully get you ready. But first, like we've started every podcast this week, we have an update on Garrett Cole. So let's just get that one out of the way. Uh, and this is what we got from Mark Feinsand of MLB.com. Garrett Cole will not need Tommy John surgery. As of now, he will rest and rehab his elbow with conservative treatment, the hope is that he will be able to return to the rotation in 10 to 12 weeks. So based on that timeline, that brings us to late May, early June, and that's obviously assuming no setbacks. We just wrapped up a 15-team Roto mock draft where he went 134th overall, right between Michael King and Mitch Keller. Thoughts on the update and I guess where he went in this draft. Well, I mean, you could take it as good news. You could take it as bad news. If it's a 10 to 12 week timetable, that's longer than one to two months. And so that's even more of the season he's going to miss. However, uh, not needing Tommy John surgery. The way who, who was that beat writer who said for now? I mean, that's. That was Mark Feinsand of MLB.com. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's a lot of cryptic language and we don't have an actual yeah. diagnosis about what it is, right? I mean, the way right, John Heyman put that's it the was, thing is it's like there. Uh, sorry, there was one one quote in that story that was like, Doctor Neil Elatrosh agreed with the team's reporter or, or doctors that there is no damage to the UCL. Right. If so, that's the case, then why would Tommy John surgery be on the table at all? Yeah. Why would he say for now? Is is that just him as a reporter? Uh kind of like saving his, you know, ju just being extra careful with his wording. And so like, if he ends up needing, I, I don't know. I don't really yeah, know. Like, the, I, I, these... There's still just like a, a lack of details here that is uh, frustrating. Yeah. The, the, the stories don't quite all add up, right? Like it's the belief. This is from uh, John Heyman's story in New York post. After Cole visited with Dr. Neil Alatrosh on Thursday, the belief is the reigning Cy Young Award winner, Ace, can avoid Tommy John surgery, the Post has learned. And that, that sounds a lot less optimistic than everything else that's being reported, right? Yeah. I, I, I guess my takeaway for fantasy is that, so I had him around pick 100, with the one to two month timetable. I had to, you know, at, at the time it wasn't like the definitive timetable, but that's what we were hearing. Um, now that he's seen Dr. Neil Elitraj and he learned he doesn't need Tommy John surgery, but it's a, it's maybe a clearer timetable, but a longer timetable. I'm going to move Garrett Cole down some more, I think. But I, I don't know. I I may I may end up drafting him a fair amount from this point forward just because I feel like people are going to be so scared that you know, if he's going in the pick 150 to 200 range, it, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of downside risk at that point. Depends how shallow the league is, I guess. If you're talking a deep 15 teamer and you need to squeeze as much productivity out of every spot you can, that's one thing. But if you're in 
if you're like most people listening, you're in a 10, 12 team shallow league and you just need maximum impact on, on your roster and you can afford a fair number of misses, then I, I think Garrett Cole at an extreme discount, uh, you know, pitching two thirds of the season, that, that could be great. So I'm, I'm going to move him down in my rankings, but I'm going to feel more comfortable taking him at the point where I move him, if that makes sense. Do you have a rough estimate, Scott? I know you had him at SP27 as of now. Are you thinking like the late 30s of starting pitcher? That would be around like where you have Sonny Gray and Kodai Senga. That's like the start of the 40s, basically. Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like I should move him below Kodai Senga, does it? Uh, that's a tough one because Cole's definitely the better pitcher, but Senga's timetable right now is late April, early May, right? Like if he, he had six weeks after he starts throwing was the latest report, he's supposed to start throwing March 22nd. That would be like May 3rd, I think. So if all goes according to plan, Senga should be back potentially a month before Garrett Cole. But maybe only two weeks. Sure. Ten, ten weeks from now is May 23rd. So that, that 10 yeah. to 12-week timetable. Yeah, I mean, and and yeah, I, I I would rather have the higher impact pitcher. I, I don't think either is like a slam dunk to return on that timetable. Yeah. You know, so that would that would uh that would obviously be something to factor into the decision as well. Yeah, I'm probably gonna move Garrett Cole just ahead of Kodai Senga there. Uh, which would be in my overall rankings. Gosh, this rankings page is kind of slow to toggle between positions. Uh, okay, so Kodai Senga overall, I have him 136. I don't know. That sounds too high. I kind of wanted it to be more like 150. I don't know. Some Somewhere in that range, somewhere in the 125 to 150 range is where I'm going to move Cole. All right, fair enough. Let's move on to our position preview updates, and we will start with catcher. And again, just going to try and catch up on everything that has happened since we did these position previews back in February. And not really much has changed at catcher. Angels mm -hmm. manager Ron Washington said he's hoping to have Logan Ohapi make 125 to 135 starts at catcher this season, which is pretty awesome for his upside. Gabriel Moreno was actually scratched today when we're recording this on Thursday due to lower back tightness. Manager Tori Lavulo said it's, quote, nothing to be alarmed with. Everything should be fine. So I think there's a clear top 17 at the position. That kind of ends with Ohapi, Bo Naylor, and Luis Campusano in ADP. That would be a top 18 if Henry Davis already had mm -hmm. catcher eligibility. He does not yet. Uh, Things are looking real good for him, though. Because Yasmani Grandal has not played in a game since February 27th. He is dealing with plantar fasciitis. Mm -hmm. And the quote from the teams, uh, I think it was the trainer, uh, was, he's not, I think this quote came out yesterday or today, he's not going to run for another week. That's pretty much the end of the spring training schedule. So, yes, Monty Grandal, I think Henry Davis is just going to be the primary catcher to, to open the season. Yeah, I hope so. I think in shallower one catcher leagues, you could probably take Henry Davis around like the pick 200 range, mm -hmm. stash him on the bench for a week or two, just take a catcher with your last pick, and then, all right, let's let's roll with Henry Davis and see how I think the shallower one catcher leagues are the ones that are harder to do that with though because the bench space is more precious and mm -hmm. you know the like if there if there are 17 good catchers to go around not counting Henry Davis you know even if you pick the wrong one you're going to get a shot at another one yeah. yeah give me your favorite catcher one and catcher two to target there are you know different variations there are one catcher leagues we know Roto are two catcher leagues uh Scott hit me with Maybe a you know one of those top seventeen you like to draft, and and maybe a catcher two you like later on. There's a lot I like to draft. Probably my favorite to draft, and one I can often get with the very last pick of a one catcher league draft is Bo Naylor. Mm -hmm. And part of what I like about Bo Naylor is he's just there. Really, aren't any catchers like it? Him, maybe, maybe JT Real Muto is kind of like this. He used to be more like this, where. Uh, Naylor excels in both plate discipline, walks and strikeouts, and he's a catcher who steals bases. So it's it's hard to say at this point whether he's better suited for Roto or better suited for points, which means he's kind of well-suited for both. And uh, it's a lot of projection because he's this is going to be his first full season. 
He bats left-handed, so maybe you worry about him losing some playing time for that reason. But um, he was so good over the final six weeks or so of last season that, uh, yeah, I'm 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 buying into Bo Naylor. Okay, do you have a catcher two you like to target? Catcher two, yes. Uh, so, you know, obviously, if you want to go heavy on catcher, you can get somebody earlier than this. But I'm I'm kind of coming around to Alejandro Kirk again. If I want to go the cheap route as my second catcher, you worry about him losing at bats to Danny Jansen, of course. But I think he still has the potential with his contact skills to be helpful in batting average. And um, it's I, I think he's a better defender than Jansen. So it's possible if he's hitting well enough, he just ends up claiming a bigger share of that uh, of that platoon than we expect. All right, Chris, give me a catcher one and catcher two that you like to target in drafts. All right, I'm going to do something very annoying, and I'm going to give you two players who probably won't play that much catcher this position. Mitch Garver is fairly clearly my favorite catcher one to draft. I'm drafting him, I would say, more often than not at this point. I know Scott also wants to draft a lot of Mitch Garver. Yeah, and here's I, the thing I feel about like Mitch Naylor Garver. surpassed him for me, but yeah, Garver's up there. Mitch Garver has played, I believe, nine games in the spring so far. He has caught once. I love hearing that because Mitch Garver has had a ton of pro- trouble staying healthy. The Mariners signed him to be their primary DH, and by golly, it looks like he's going to be their primary DH. Mitch Garver uh, over the, let me see, let me get the, the numbers correct. Since the 2019 season, his per 162 game pace is 37 homers, 87 runs, 90 RBI. Now, I don't expect him to play 162 games, even if he's the primary DH, but he might just be the best hitter at the catcher position if he stays healthy. And hopefully playing DH helps him stay healthy. My my favorite number two catcher, and I'm finally, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I moved Tyler Soderstrom into my top 250 of my overall rankings. That makes him a top 20 catcher overall. This was a guy who still like a consensus top 80 prospect, despite having a pretty rough 2024 season, but he has played 268 games at the minor league level. Let's cut that in half, say 134 games per season, 31 homers per 134 games. Tyler Soderstrom has potentially difference making power at a position where that's hard to find. So he is a risky number two catcher and, Unfortunately, in non-CBS leagues, he's not actually catcher eligible. So you you will have to wait a little while, as with Henry Davis. All right, my favorite catcher one and catcher two to draft, Wilson Contreras of the Cardinals and Logan O'Hoppy. If I wait on my catcher two, then uh, I am looking at someone like Ryan Jeffers, who Scott mentioned yesterday on our Deep Sleepers podcast, or Austin Wells, who's having a really great spring here with the New York Yankees. Let's quickly promote a few things. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks to everybody for being here live on YouTube. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. That's youtube.com slash fantasy baseball today. And it's that time of the year. Brackets are back and you can get in on the madness today on the CBS Sports app. Run men's and women's pools with friends and Enter our bracket challenges for the chance to win a new Nissan Rogue and trips to the 2025 Final Four. Play today on the CBS Sports app or visit cbssports.com slash play to sign up. No purchase necessary. See terms and rules for details. And if you want to compete against Scott, Chris, and me, we actually have a bracket dedicated to FBT and our listeners. You can scan the QR code on the screen or click on the link in the pod and YouTube description to get in on the fun. If you've joined our bracket in previous years, then you're already in. All you have to do is go in and make your picks. The winner of our bracket group will get a shout out here on the podcast. Let's move on to first base. What has happened since February? Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has missed a few days recently with a left knee contusion. Doesn't sound overly serious, but he missed a few games, and I saw that he was back playing DH. Uh, Noel V. Marte was suspended 80 games. He doesn't play first base, but it should help the playing time for Christian Encarnacion Strand, who mm, I am getting pretty excited about myself. I just drafted him in that mock draft. Uh, Nathaniel Lowe suffered a right oblique strain, which will likely cause him to miss the first few weeks of the season, maybe the first month. And it sounds like one of Justin Foscue or Jared Walsh will be uh, 
filling in at first base for the Rangers. Chris, a first baseman that you like to target. First baseman that I like to target. Increasingly, it's becoming Vladimir Guerrero, although I know that's a boring pick because he's an early round pick. But if he's there in the third round, I'm trying to take him. If not, um, probably Tristan Casas. I just, I, I think there's a, I think there's a real chance we're talking about him as one of the best hitters in baseball this season. Like, I think a 300 average and 40 homers is within the realm of possibility for Tristan Casas. Obviously, that's a ceiling projection, but that's yeah. the pace he was on from July 1st last year on. I love Tristan Casas too. <laughs> I've loved him for a long time. I have yet to draft him even once. And I'm not sure I've drafted him that many times either, honestly. I think everybody loves him. Well, yeah, that's, that's the problem. Part of it, yeah. And maybe I just maybe I need to move him ahead of Christian Walker in my rankings. That feels a little um it 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 feels like not a good process, mm -hmm. but there will only be one outcome for each of these players. And if I'm that confident in the outcome for Tristan Casas, maybe I just need to do it. Maybe I need to move him up a whole tier and into the same tier with Cody Bellinger and Paul Goldschmidt, leave, leave Christian Walker behind just so I have more opportunities to draft Tristan Casas. The one, the one chance I had at him was in the head to head point salary cap draft. He ended up, I, I ended up getting Vinny Pasquantino for the same amount because Pasquantino was nominated first. And I thought, ah, that's a good price for Pasquantino. And then Casas went for the same amount. I was like, yeah, I'd rather have Casas. That's a whiff, yeah. Yeah. But, but that, was, that was the one chance. He, he always goes before it's really on my radar. Mm -hmm. So is he your answer, Scott? Tristan Casas? I, well, he can't be because I never drafted him. <laughs> uh, my favorite first baseman to draft is Matt Olson. That's my boring answer because I just think, uh, the run in RBI production. I don't see any reason why it would decline significantly. Like he, he had close, he had cl around 250 combined runs in RBI last year. It, it seems like 200 would be the floor, uh, presuming good health. And that's a very high floor, not to mention all the home runs he hits. So yeah, I love, I love Matt Olson at the one, two turn. I almost always get him if I'm picking there. Um, but if you want to go somebody who's not so early, my favorite first baseman to draft is probably Vinny Pasquantino. I do like Tristan Casas more, but I, but Vinny Pasquantino, except for that one salary cap draft, is much more affordable. Mm -hmm. And I think he was everything we wanted him to be through 38 games last year, and that's when his shoulders started bothering him. Exit velocity fell. Everything fell. But I, I, think, I think he's a post-type sleeper because now he's going outside the top 150. Why are you saying his name like that, Scott? It's so weird. Vinny P, P, baby. Baby. That's right. My favorite to draft the, uh, I guess we all have a boring answer early on. Bryce Harper, the hitter that I love to draft. If I can get him in the second round, I would love to do that. Tristan Casas in the mid rounds. <laughs> we all love Tristan Casas. Uh, definitely looking to prioritize Christian and Carnacion Strand, mm -hmm. who I've moved up a little bit. Uh, last year, hit 33 home runs between the minors and the majors, and he finished really strong. Final 24 games. Hit 333 with nine homers, a 1055 OPS, and nearly a 17% barrel rate. So, absolutely love the upside here for Encarnacion Strand. Let's take our first break. When we return, the rest of the infield positions here on Fantasy Baseball Today. Who's in? Who's out? Let the madness begin. The NCAA Men's Basketball Championship Selection Show on CBS and streaming on Paramount Plus. Welcome back in on to the second base updates. Xander Bogarts will play second base this season, so he will gain that eligibility early on in the season. Also going to hit leadoff, at least based on spring. He's hit leadoff almost exclusively, so huh. that's uh, pretty exciting for a guy who mostly hit fourth and fifth last season. That that's probably a 5 to 10% increase in plate appearances for him. I feel like earlier in spring they were using Tatis at leadoff, but maybe they're just kind of experimenting with a bunch of different things. They have a new manager in Mike Schilt, so uh, he might be figuring that out. But yeah, Bogart's leading off. That, that would be fun. Matt McClain has returned from his oblique injury. Jonathan India returned from the plantar fasciitis, though that never really goes away. Zach Geloff has looked amazing in spring training. Jackson Holiday looks like he will be on the opening day roster uh, and the team's starting second baseman, so he'll gain that eligibility. 
His NFBC ADP is up to 162 over the past week. We just did that mock draft here on Thursday night, and he went 144th overall. Vaughn Grissom, last one to mention, expected to start the year on the IL with a groin injury. Wait, I lied. One more. Gavin Lux will play second base instead of shortstop. Scott, over to you. Favorite second baseman to target. My favorite second baseman to target is probably Zach Geloff because I think he profiles very similarly to Matt McClain, and yet he goes off the board 70 picks later. And, I mean, you just pace out his numbers as a rookie. It's it's 30-30 production. I'm not saying I'm projecting him for that, but, you know, even 25-25 for uh, the 130th pick in the draft would be super. So I'll say Zach Geloff is my favorite to draft, but but second base is probably the position where I have where my teams are most varied from draft to draft because there's a, there are a lot of second basemen in that range that I like, and if it if it turns out I can get one of the stud second basemen Altuve, Ozzy Albies, or Marcus Simeon in round three, I'll usually do that. All right, Chris, over to you. Favorite second baseman to target? I think it's probably two guys that are extremely unexciting and it's Glaber Torres and Xander Bogarts. Nobody seems all that intrigued by a couple of guys who I guess Bogarts didn't quite go 2020 last season. It was 1919. Uh, I believe Bogart or Glaber did go 2020. Am I, am I correct in that? He didn't steal enough bases. Didn't actually. steal enough bases. It was like closer to 15. Maybe I think it was 24 and 12. Okay. Like Is that. Bogarts so. also going to be your favorite shortstop to draft? Uh no, probably not. I haven't I haven't looked at shortstop yet. Nobody's but, drafted him at yeah. second base. Yeah, he's not a second baseman technically yet. Uh, yeah. and if it's not those guys, it's definitely either Nolan Gorman in like the fifteenth round, although people keep pushing him up recently, or Brandon Lau, who again mm -hmm. ADP says he should be going really late, and every time we draft, he gets drafted way before his ADP. So yeah. He I goes, would love to have one of those guys. I think they're the two best power hitters at the position, probably, except for Mookie Betts. And uh, I, I love them both. Yeah, Lowe, Brandon Lowe, I think, is the most underdrafted player. He's, he's going around pick 300, except in our drafts. <laughs> and uh, I got him very late in TGFBI as my starting second baseman. Yeah. So especially in those really deep leagues where you're just you're not going to have a good player everywhere, I think... Brandon Lowe is somebody to strategize around at second base. Yeah. He, so, so that's he, a good call. He missed about a month last year with that back issue, which has been recurring and that's scary. But mm -hmm. I believe once he came back, his pace over 162 games was like 36 homers and I, I mean, over 190 up, runs in RBI. Like he, he had 21, even for the yeah. time he missed. So you add those 21 to whatever fill in you get at second base, yeah. you know, it's not hard. I, to, I, Fully agree. He's one of the best values in drafts at any position right now. Yeah. Yeah. I just took him in the Raz Slam, which is a best ball contest. And I think that's probably the, the best yeah. kind of contest to get Brandon Lau in because you don't, you don't have to, uh, you know, worry about when you're starting him. It's just, if he has a couple of monster weeks, you're, you're getting those fantasy points. Mm -hmm. Favorite second baseman for me to target. I'm going to go kind of boring again. I, I would love to get one of the top guys like Albi, Semi and Altuve in the third round. It's, Love sure. doing that anytime it's possible. Uh, if not, usually wind up with one of those speedsters in the middle round. Bryson Stott is probably the one that I like most, but I don't mind Andres Jimenez. Scott mentioned Zach Geloff. Um, mm -hmm. But if I wait, I like Nolan Gorman, obviously, like uh, Chris does as well. Let's move over to third base. And uh, the big one, as we mentioned earlier, Noel V. Marte has been suspended 80 games for PEDs. Jamer Candelario will play third base for the Cincinnati Reds. Manny Machado has been playing in spring games, but only as the DH as he recovers from off-season elbow surgery. Still good to see him playing. Josh Young has not been playing. He suffered a calf strain in mid-February and has yet to return. Manager Bruce Bochy said the plan is for Young to play in the team's Final two exhibition games on March 25th and 26th. His NFBC ADP over the past week is 137.4. So Josh Young is falling a little bit. Chris, I, I know he's someone you like to target. Um, what do you think about that price tag, knowing the injury right now? Yeah, the injury is a little scary, and, and he's probably someone that, 
like I've kept him inside my top 100. I should probably, I guess, move him down because I end up passing on him multiple times every draft we do. But by all, all indications are he's going to be ready for opening day. And as long as he is, I think he's a, a 30 homer guy who might have 200 plus runs and RBI combined in this lineup. So I still really like drafting him. If I can get him with a 10th or 11th round pick rather than an eighth round pick, all the better. Ray's top prospect, Junior Caminero, has been reassigned to AAA, but we're hoping to see him early in the season. And Padres prospect, Graham Pauly, will start at third base while Manny Machado is limited to designated hitter. Scott, over to you. Favorite third baseman to target. You know, I might be open to taking Josh Young at a discount if his discounted price wasn't still higher than Jake Berger, who I think is better. I think Jake Berger is better. I think... He's uh, there's a good chance he hits 40 homers this year. And with the improvements he made with the, with the strikeout rate after joining the Marlins um, cut down on his swing on purpose, he was generating huge exit velocities and the average exit velocity went down a little bit with the Marlins, but I think like nine of his 15 hardest hit balls on the year were with them. 11 of his 17 hard, something like that. And he hit over 300 with him. Don't think he's going to hit 300 over a full season, but he might hit 270, 275 with 40 homers, and he's going outside pick 150. So Jake Berger is uh, is my favorite third baseman to draft, and third base is my favorite position to wait on. I, I don't know if we should be like giving like a broad take on on these positions, but mm-hmm. like I don't think in a league that counts. I don't think I have Jose Ramirez, Austin Riley, or Rafael Devers in any because because I like the mid to late round range of third base so much. All right, Chris, over to you. Third baseman to target. Um, It's a lot of Josh Young. It's a lot of Cabrian Hayes. If I'm waiting, I really like Colt Keith as a late round pick. Um, and uh, yeah, those three. All right. I kind of like the Bregman, Arenado mini tier in the, in the mm-hmm. middle rounds. Usually, you know, in a categories league, round seven or eight in a points league for Bregman. You're probably yeah. going to use like a third or fourth round pick on him. But if I do miss out on those, it's burger time. I like Jake Berger. Uh, we, we, I don't know. That's we good, all like the same players. So here we go. That's actually, that's a good point about the points league, because I think my perspective at third base changes quite a bit. A, a lot of the third basemen, young and Berger included, uh, even at the top, Austin Riley and Rafael Devers, they're not as valuable in points leagues because their plate discipline isn't very good. So I really gravitate toward Alex Bregman and Max Muncy in those formats and, and try try hard to get one of them. Shortstop, what has changed since February? Mookie Betts will be the Dodgers' starting shortstop, and so he will gain that eligibility on CBS early in the season. Corey Seager continues to recover from sports hernia surgery. He took light swings earlier this week and apparently said it would be, quote, irresponsible to think he would not be ready for opening day. It's a weird quote, but yeah, the thing I keep coming back to is that he missed like five weeks last year with was a thumb injury, something like that early on. I think hamstring. Yeah, whatever it was, he didn't go on a a rehab assignment. He just did batting practice one day and then was activated. So they're, they're willing to do that with him. And obviously he finished second in MVP voting last year, despite missing all that time. So, he had both a hamstring and a thumb injury. He missed more go. time, more time with the hamstring. That was the early injury. Look at there us. You go. Look at us. We're both Look right. Us. Gunner, Henderson. <laughs> Gunner Henderson will mostly play shortstop the season and has returned from his oblique injury. Anthony Volpe has apparently leveled out his swing, hoping for more line drives, and he's looked pretty good so far this spring. Ten for thirty-two. Uh, that's a three thirteen batting average with three stolen bases. Chris. You can start us off this time. Favorite shortstop to target. But we can't hear you because you are muted. Favorite shortstop to target is probably Xander Bogarts. Cheater. It is. Yeah, that, it is. You said it yeah. wouldn't be. Uh, Liar. I, um, yeah, if it's not him, I'm I like waiting and taking Trevor Story. Um I would love to take O'Neill Cruz, but it's he's a race. gonna it's a race he, to see who gets him first. He's a he's a third or fourth round pick now, I think. Like that that's just that's where we are. The right. the hype has gotten out of control. I'm not drafting him there. 
third or fourth uh, round really i, I, I think, think i'm in the fourth round in our 15 teamer yeah. but like the middle maybe of round in fifth, four, maybe yeah uh but three would be in a 12 team league he's he's probably a i think his adp has settled in in the sixth but I, i've seen a lot of 12 team leagues where he now goes in the fifth so three yeah. would make it a close call who's going earlier between ellie de la cruz and o'neill cruz yeah i um, i so that's I, I, yeah, I, I, I went ahead and took him in this draft in the middle of round four. So that would have been pick, uh, around pick 50. Yeah. Over the last week at NFC drafts, he's 56. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's okay. He's kind of the last shortstop I'm really excited to draft. Do you have him ahead of Matt McLean or behind? I don't know. I I have, I I always think of Matt McLean as a second baseman. I don't know. Well, you I mean, took, in real you, life, that's what he's playing. But. You, you took O'Neill Cruz over Matt McLean in this mock draft. We I think that's what you should do. Yeah, I don't know if that's actually what my rankings show. Though I'd have to, uh, I'd have to check that because I had this was the first time I had occasion to draft O'Neill Cruz, and yes, I do have him ranked ahead of Matt McLean. So that mystery is solved. Uh, it's just that's a point when I'm building my teams where I'm pretty much always looking at starting pitcher instead. Mm-hmm. And if I'm not looking at starting pitcher, I'm looking at outfields like uh, Mike Trout or Cody Bellinger. I'm filling what in my mind are those scarcer positions, but shortstop is kind of next in line. It, I guess it's a distant third for me in terms of scarcity. I said O'Neill Cruz was like the last shortstop I was excited to draft. So I don't know. Maybe I need to think about taking him there more because Clearly, the clearly his swing is not messed up. He is still capable of hitting balls 115 plus miles per hour. Um, his strikeout rate is down this spring, like it was last spring. And uh, I don't know how much he'll run coming off that gruesome leg injury. I think he has stolen one base this spring, so that's I think you are correct. Infinitely more than zero. But he was 98 percent on sprint speed in 2022. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's he's still pretty exciting. And I'm glad we got this chance to talk about him, you guys. Should we talk about some other shortstops, too? I don't know. Is he? I thought he was your answer for favorite to draft. No, he's not. Oh, all right. Did I talk about him too much, considering? <laughs> <laughs> well, very quickly, give me a name. <laughs> Francisco Lindor. If he's there at the 2-3 turn, I am always taking him. Yeah, that was all three of our answer for our favorite shortstop to draft when we did this the first time. It still is. It's just such, there's nobody else I really like in that range. The second baseman, maybe, but I'd rather have Lindor than any of them. And uh, yeah, so if I'm picking on that side of the draft, unless I already took Bobby Witt, of course, almost always take it Lindor. In that mock draft we just did, I took Lindor in the second round, again, 15 team league. Uh, as the 20th overall player, I paired him with Shohei Otani. And I kind of like the way the team turned out. So, uh, yeah, much like a lot of players, it's uh, the race to Lindor. Let's see who can get him. I, I, I am drafting a lot of Jackson Holiday if I can give a lower guy. Mm-hmm. I've wound up with a lot of uh, Xander Bogarts as well. I mean, maybe those were the leagues where I wasn't with Chris, but <laughs> I think I got him in NL Labor. Uh, actually, I got him in our, our auction that we did a couple of weeks ago just because I think the bidding stopped at like 10 or $11. So, all right, I'll, I'll take Xander Bogarts if, if no one else wants him, which... That's what it kind of feels yeah, like right now. Nobody is excited nobody. about Xander Bogart, yeah, Bogarts, even though I, I think there are legitimate reasons to be excited. And later on in draft, someone I like to target is Trevor Story. I kind of feel like he is the uh, discount Anthony Volpe, even though he's been in the league for much longer. It's going like 60 picks later. And I think Trevor Story will go 2020 this year. It's just mm-hmm. what will the yeah. batting average look like at the end of the season? A- am I holding us up too much? Because I see that our show is only half over and we're already nearing wrapping up at shortstop. So can we, can we, can I talk more? Or are you going to, we got news and notes, Scott? News and notes. We have news and notes. And I- there's I a lot to... to say about outfield starting pitcher <laughs> and relief pitcher, Scott. So I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> okay. I wanted to say for Anthony Volpe, that comparison you made between Volpe and Trevor Story. And Frank never gets mad at me, by the way. I didn't want to make it seem like he does. Um, Anthony Volpe is the maybe the most overdrafted player at around 130 ahead of like Zach Geloff and more specifically 50 to 75 picks ahead of Jackson Holiday and Trevor Story when I think A, they have more upside and B, they may be more likely to meet their upside. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not totally ruling out Anthony Volpe taking a big step forward, especially with those swing changes, but 
it's it's so, it's too optimistic. Here's it, he's my being thing. drafted as if that's for sure going to fix everything. And here's my thing about the swing changes, right? Is we've seen Anthony Volpe at the major league level in the minors. He's one of those guys who really had to tool his swing for power to even be able to hit for the relatively modest power that he has. You know, I think it was 21 homers in, in the minors in 2022. It was 23 last season, maybe 24, whatever the, the uh, af- actual number was. The, all this talk about him f- you know, fixing his swing makes me wonder, is there any power upside here? Or are we looking at like, Maybe he makes up for it by stealing more. I don't know. He was a 50 steal guy, but he was in the minors, but he was only like 78th percentile in sprint speed last season. So I just like, maybe the swing change helps and he hits 265. Mm -hmm. Does that come with 10 homers and 25 steals? Is he just, are are we hoping he becomes Tyro Estrada? Like I'm, it's it's really hard to say because he was 22 last year. Yes. Right. And so you don't, you don't want to look at anything he did last year with much finality at all. At least that's I don't. fair. But at the same time, you're drafting him 120th. Like that, I just that is such an optimistic outlook mm-hmm. given the quality of of upside plays at shortstop going again 50 to 75 picks later. Yeah. Let's take our final break. When we return, we've got some news, and then we go into the outfield starting pitcher and reliever here on Fantasy Baseball today. Two big boys get ready to play. Big being the operative word here. And here they come. Welcome back in. Let's quickly hit the news and notes. And Brewers manager Pat Murphy was asked Thursday about having a defined closer in the absence of Devin Williams. Here is what he said. Quote, I don't think that's important, especially not now. He added, he's open to eventually naming a closer if a clear candidate emerges. And Scott, we were talking beforehand. You read something interesting about Abner Uribe. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how interesting it was. Uh, Jack Magruder, who writes for the, the Brewers' official team site, uh, he he suggested that maybe Uribe would make more sense. But, you know, that that's one man's opinion, and it's not like he was citing anyone in the organization as saying that. Uh, he's, it's a very exciting arm. You know, mm-hmm. throwing 103, and certainly the strikeout numbers were impressive for the second half of the year when Uribe uh, or Abner Uribe was up. But uh, I mean, he's he's obviously not as established as Yoel Piamps, and I still think I draft Piamps first of the two. I just I just don't think I draft them that far apart. I I kind of get the sense from those comments that they would like. Abner Uribe to take the job, but he's just so young and still so new to to, to being a major leaguer that and, it's, and not, it's just not that. safe to put that. It's not fair to put that on him. He also like, what was it? Six per nine, six walks per nine. Yeah. Some control issues. It's, yeah. It, it's not just like, like he that. wasn't, you know, like his control was bad in the minors. He was pretty routinely 15 to 20% walk rate in the minors. He was 16% last year. So I, it's not just that he's unproven. It might also just be like untenable control. But if he's unhittable, then you could have four walks per nine pretty easily. Sure. You know, 6.2 hits per nine in the minors, 4.7 in the majors. Like that's pretty unhittable. Mm-hmm. Are you guys saying that we should pie yomps the breaks? Yes, um, I'm I'm <laughs> drafting Piamps as if he's the closer. More in, in our mock, our, our 15 team mock, where of course closers are plundered uh, in in a league that that size. Um, so where did they go? Piamps, you took you t- actually Chris, took you took Piamps, and I took Uribe. Mm-hmm. And let me cool. see if I can Fight. find Fight. The spots where we took them. I took you took Piamps 180th overall, and I took Uribe 293rd overall. So. 113 picks apart. All right, let's move on to Aaron Judge, who said Thursday that he would definitely be in the lineup if this were a regular season game, and he's missed the past few days with an abdominal injury. I think the hope is for him to play at some point this weekend. You know, there was all... I I admit, I reacted. I don't know if I overreacted, but I'm blaming the Yankees and their inability to just be normal and give us any kind of details. Cause like when they said Aaron judge 
was dealing with mid-season soreness or whatever it was this weekend. Spring my ouchies. Thought, I think my that's thought, what they said. My thought was it's the toe because they didn't give us any details on what it was. Well, they said it wasn't the toe. And then they give us this. It's the abdo- abdomen. He's taking a couple of days yeah. off and he's fine. I'm still, I'm fine. I moved him down to 15. I'm okay with that. There, there's a lot of injury risk. I think he also has as much upside as anyone outside of Acuna. It's just a uh, a risk reward thing there. I'll, I'll take him at the end of the first in a 15 team league, but I'm, the Yankees are annoying. They <laughs> are. The way the Yankees handle injuries is like, it's really bad. That's, I, I don't, I, that's not the most articulate way to say it, but it's bad and I don't like it. I agree with you. I think that there is also some hoopla involved with, I'm not going to blame all of the media. We are part of the media, I guess, technically. But there was a report on, I guess this would have been Wednesday night, Tuesday night, from Mm -hmm. Pat Ragazzo, Ragazzo, that Aaron Judge is dealing with pain in his oblique and still has problems with his right big toe. I read this. There was nobody else out there that had anything Mm -hmm. close to this. And they asked Aaron Judge about it, and he's like, my toe is perfectly fine. I'm dealing with an, an abdominal thing. Like, People just making things like, where is this coming from? Like, I have I no idea where that came from. I did from. see a report earlier this spring. I don't think it was the same thing that, that, yeah, that said Judge might have to manage the toe mm-hmm. pain yeah. throughout the season. So it, it may just be, it may just be that there's too much media <laughs> in the Yankees. And so, like, Maybe. people take certain liberties. Hey, I'm reporting here. And, you know, it's, it's fair enough to say, okay, well, I saw this, this same report of, um, you know, he's going to have to manage the pain in the toe and then to, to, to kind of work it into a sentence in the way you're talking about Frank. And and it just kind of, the more that original report gets repurposed and the wording changes ever so slightly, then it, it ends up becoming a different message. You know, it's kind of like telephone, like a game of telephone. And there's too, there are too many people commenting on the Yankees. That's the problem. We've got to keep things moving. Ronald Acuna returned to action as the DH on Thursday. He went 0 for 3 with two strikeouts, but good to see him back. Gavin Williams is scheduled to resume a throwing program after three or four days, but will begin the season on the IL due to a sore elbow. And do you guys plan to move Gavin Williams down even further? A I little think, bit. Sounds yeah, like a, he's going to be thrown in three, four days, minimum stay on the IL. So just a little bit. I moved him down to about 50 at starting pitcher, like 190 overall. All right, Yuri Perez still believes that he'll be able to build up properly ahead of opening day, despite the fingernail issue that uh, issues that have plagued him this spring. Michael Kopech is being moved to the bullpen, and it's not crazy to think that he could work into the closer mix there. I know I wrapped up yesterday's podcast saying that Jordan Leisure would get the first save for the White Sox. I think that's still possible, but uh, Soroka has flashed at times in the bullpen. Mm-hmm. I looked at his numbers. Kopech. Kopech. What he I said Soroka. Gosh. Different Michael. Uh, yeah, different Michael. Kopech has pitched well out of the bullpen at time. He has a 13K per nine as a reliever. What do you guys think? I I have very little interest in Michael Kopech as a starter. I have moderate to mild interest in Michael Kopech as a reliever. You mentioned the 100 strikeouts in 69 innings in 2021, right? I think it was 2021. Am I remembering that correctly? I didn't mention exactly any years or numbers, but I I, th- I think it was 2021, 103 strikeouts in 69 innings. He was really, really good. His slider, it was the last time his slider looked good at all. It's been really bad the last couple of seasons. So if he can rediscover it, I, I'll have some interest in Michael Kopech. He's definitely worth a, a late round dart throw. The same brain you yeah. were doing with Jordan Leisure. That's so Scott Merkin, the White Sox beat writer for MLB.com, he had an article speculating will Kopech be the next closer and he got comments from the GM the manager Kopech himself and my takeaway from all that was we're intrigued by that idea but let's Mm -hmm. just see him find some consistency first (laughs) all right uh that means the White Sox current rotation is Eric Fetty Michael Soroka that's where the Soroka came in Chris Flexen Garrett Crochet and Nick Nestrini who does have some prospect appeal and Maybe a name to pay attention to early in the season. Well, Andrew Thorpe. Yes, Andrew Thorpe. Uh, though the White Sox are apparently mulling signing Mike Clevenger and or Michael Lorenzen. So that would uh, kill the dreams of Nick Nishu. Too many mics. Yeah, lots of mics going on. Uh, apparently the Yankees are interested in Michael Lorenzen as well. We shall see. 
Say Suzuki is likely to bat second for the Cubs, and I guess that would mean that Nico Horner will be leading off. Tommy Edmond will open the season on the IL after being shut down again due to lingering pain in his surgically repaired right wrist. Lars Newbar will be reevaluated on Saturday. He's been out uh, because of two non-displaced fractures in his left rib cage. The Braves signed Adam Duvall to a one-year deal, and the plan is for him to be the short side platoon with Jared Kelnick in left field. Going back on what they said. This is so weird. Jared Kelnick got a couple hits this spring. I, I think he literally has a couple of hits. I think <laughs> he's like two for point. 30. <laughs> um, it's been the bad. weird thing is last year, he really wasn't all that good against righties. And he was pretty good against lefties. So it's kind of yeah. a, a I, strange fit. I think it's just taking the pressure off. And yeah. like if it doesn't work out, then they can pivot to Duval full time. Who was there? everyday center fielder when they won the world series three years ago. So they, they have a good history there. And, you know, I don't think Duvall's going to matter for uh standard leagues, at least mm -hmm. not right away, but he's still, he's got plenty of pop if he finds his way into more regular playing time. All right, let's get into the outfield and provide some updates since we uh, did our outfield preview. And uh, again, these might not be the most recent updates, but a lot has happened since uh, back in February, we will start at the top of ADP and work our way down. We mentioned Acuna had that scare with irritation to his meniscus, but seems like he's all good. He returned on Thursday, still the consensus first overall pick. We mentioned what's going on with Aaron Judge. Each of us has dropped him a few spots. He's a late first rounder, like mid to late first rounder in a head-to-head -head points league, early second round pick in Roto or categories. Michael Harris looks like he is going to bat sixth for the Atlanta Braves. Scott loves uh, Randy Rosarena's biceps, and he is now known as the muscle hamster. On this podcast. I don't love Randy Rosarena, but, but I do biceps. love looking at those biceps. Yes. They, are, they are some some beefy biceps. Cody Bellinger re-signed with the Cubs. Josh Lowe is dealing with inflammation, but is aiming to return to games this weekend, hopefully Sunday or start of next week on Monday. Wyatt Langford is crushing spring training. In fact, he... I think just hit another grand slam right now while we're talking and looks increasingly likely to be on the Rangers opening day roster His NFBC ADP over the past week, 98.9. He went 59th overall in the mock draft that we just did. Same guy. The same guy keeps taking him in like the round three, four range in these mocks. So. I kind of don't, I want him not to take him. So we can, so we can see what else. someone else says, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when do you guys feel comfortable actually selecting Wyatt Langford. Uh, after Jackson Jorio, I'm still preferring Jorio. So probably not. Probably uh, probably start to think about it where that ADP is in recently around pick 100. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah, I have him 114th, but I do have Jackson Jorio 112th. So. Riley Green has returned from Tommy John surgery on his non-throwing arm and has been playing in spring games. Cedric Mullen, Mullins was dealing with a hamstring injury, but actually returned here on Thursday. Ian Happ is dealing with a hamstring injury, but expects to be ready for opening day. We mentioned what's going on with Tommy Edmond and Lars Newbar. Jackson Merrill will be on the Padres opening day roster and is expected to play center field. So he will gain that outfield eligibility. He's shortstop as of now, uh, but yes, will should be dual eligible. He went 205th overall in that mock draft that we just did. And worth mentioning, Nationals outfield prospect James Wood. He is destroying the spring and we recorded our mailbag podcast earlier today, and he uh, we did a spotlight on James Wood. So you can listen to that on this Saturday. It'll be out, and you can get our thoughts. Favorite outfielders to draft? Chris, we'll start with you. One early, one mid, one late. Ooh, how how early is early? Uh, top three or four rounds. Ronald Acuna. Yeah, I mean, Ronald Acuna would be great. Um, you finally got first pick in our mind. If I have a pick and Ronald Acuna is available, buddy, I'm taking it. <laughs> um, <laughs> hashtag analysis. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, relative to everyone else, I think it's probably Luis Robert, just because you guys hate him so much. No, I don't hate that him. That I, I, I think you both have him as a bust. I do. Um, I, don't uh, I don't actually have him as a bust, but I could. I could make that argument. But I, I have him as a top 30 player. I think the chances that he goes, I mean, what, what was it, 38-20 last year? I, he's real good. I know the, the it's been inconsistent, but what if that's just what he is now? It's what he was always supposed to be. The quality of contact wasn't quite that good, but I, I think Luis Robert is 
Very, very good. So if we're talking early round pick, it's him. A little lower, Christian Yelich. I, I know it's boring, but I seem to be taking him a lot as like a number two or three outfielder. And um, I'll say Riley Green just because he's a top 100 player for me and I can get him around 120th, 130th in most drafts. Is that not low end enough? No, it's not actually. <laughs> um, We need a late name, Chris. Max Kepler, I'm going to draft Max Kepler pretty much everywhere. He took a big step forward in his quality of contact last season. Doesn't look like he needs to uh, sacrifice batting average to hit for power like he did in the past. If he can sustain that, I think Max Kepler could be a top 30 outfielder this season. Scott, you are up. And mm -hmm. uh, three outfielders you like to target. One early, one mid, one late. Well... I like to take one of the top nine outfielders in round one. If, if, uh, you know, I, I do like taking Bobby Witt second overall and, and Roto, but otherwise I really hope to get an outfielder. Um, to put more specific, to put a specific name to it, Mike Trout and Josh Lowe, I guess would be the early choices for me. Mike Trout. I, he, he's sometimes there as late as round five and there's, no need to draft him earlier than round four. And he could still have a pretty typical Mike Trout season. I don't think he's the safer batting average anymore. And he doesn't run much anymore unless Ron Washington changes the, the culture there, as he's talked about the running culture. Um, but yeah, I mean the run and RBI production, particularly on a per game basis for Trout, the home run production should still be amazing. Josh Lowe was one of just eight players to have at least 20 homers and 30 steals last year. And all the, the other seven go in rounds one and two. And Josh Lowe's hanging out there around six, seven, eight. And uh, I, I think that's, I think that's an easy call, particularly given how scarce outfield is. And, and, you know, he managed to do that despite sitting a lot for the Rays last year. I think that, I think it's more likely his playing time goes up than down. Uh, now that he's more established. So those are the two early ones. Mid-round, let's say, uh, who is he? Uh, Evan Carter. I've come around to him probably a lot since the first outfield preview. I just think prominent spot in that deep lineup, good on base skills. I don't know exactly where the home run stolen base total is going to wind up, but I think it could be between 15. It should be between 15 and 30 of each, probably like 20 to 25 of each with a ton of runs, ton of RBI. Really like Evan Carter. And lower, I try to avoid going too low in outfield. It's a big priority for me on draft day. But Christopher Morell, I like the power upside, and he won't be a zero for speed. If you want to go even deeper than that, Sal Freelich hardly gets drafted in 12-team leagues, mm -hmm. and I think he has good batting average and steals potential and is probably going to be multi-eligible since uh, the Brewers are messing around with him in the infield a lot this spring. All right, for me, it's going to be Randy Rosarena and his biceps. Sounds like he could steal a few more bases this year, too, so hopefully that happens. Seiya Suzuki in the middle rounds showed the flashes. Uh, I just We need him to put it together. I, I think he's certainly capable of being really good regardless of format in, in both head-to-head -head points and in a categories league. And Tyler O'Neill entering a contract year in Fenway Park. I think it's a perfect fit. Just has to stay on the field. Obviously, that's a big hurdle. You know, Chris, I'm disappointed. Because I left one name for you, and you didn't take the bait. Oh, Jaron Duran. Jaron Duran. Yeah, that that that's an oversight. I apologize. That <laughs> that that is one that I I have Jaron Duran as a top one hundred and sixty player. He's my outfielder number thirty six. He tends to go a lot later than that. I'm I'm a big fan. Uh, All right. Real quickly too, I take a lot of Jackson Chorio. If he's there around pick one hundred, I'm almost certainly taking him. All right, starting pitcher updates. <laughs> oh, all right. Buckle up. There's a lot. You're fully aware of what's going on with Garrett Cole. We spoke about it earlier, hoping to return in 10 to 12 weeks from now. That's late May, early June. Kevin Gosman is dealing with shoulder fatigue. He threw a bullpen earlier this week and remains optimistic for opening day. How far did you guys move Gosman down your SP ranks? Not a lot. Uh, I think it went from being my SP five at the time because Cole was still ahead of him to SP uh, 10, five to 10. And I may move him up a little bit now that things are looking up. Yeah. He's SP 10 for me. He was around SP five before, um, he got through his bullpen session on Tuesday. Well, and 
I really haven't seen any updates since. He's going to face live hitters in his next throwing session. It's just a question of whether it's in a game or if it's in a live BP session. Blake Snell and Jordan Montgomery both remain unsigned. Yuri Perez is dealing with that fingernail issue, but remains optimistic for opening day. Dylan Cease was just traded to the Padres yesterday. Kodai Senga is dealing with a moderate posterior capsule strain in his right shoulder. He went 148th in that mock draft we just did, and I think he'll go a little bit later than that in mm -hmm. leagues with no IL spots. Sonny Gray is dealing with a right hamstring injury, hopes to be ready for opening day still. Justin Verlander will start in the IL because of a right shoulder issue. Walker Bueller will start in the IL to save his innings for later in the year. Emmett Sheehan will also start in the IL. It looks like Gavin Stone will be the Dodgers SP5 to begin the year. Gavin Williams will start on the IL with that uh, right elbow issue. It looks like, <laughs> seriously, Carlos Carrasco might be this team's SP yeah. to start the year. So I kind of work, I hope it works out like a, a homecoming to Cleveland. That would be pretty cool. Shane Boz was going to begin the season in extended spring training and then tweaked his oblique. We don't really have a timetable for Shane Boz as of now. Lucas Giolito is out for the year because of elbow surgery. Taj Bradley will start. Oh, Giolito had the internal brace procedure, by the way, not full Tommy John. So could be ready for the start of next season, possibly. All right. Taj Bradley will start on the IL because of a right pec injury. Braxton Garrett and Edward Cabrera will both start in the IL with shoulder injuries. AJ Puck and Ryan Weathers are expected to step in, and they both have some sleeper appeal. Alec Manoa has a cranky shoulder, and it seems like Bowden Francis will be the Blue Jays' fifth starter to open the season. Scott, you get first dibs. Early, mid, late. Favorite starting pitchers to draft. Early, mid, late. Tarek Skubal? Tarek Skubal and Cole Reagans are probably the early picks. And, you know, if, if you're just random listener out there who isn't in a league of, of, of people who follow – our content, then there's a good chance you could get Reagan's more like a mid round pick. I mean, his, his composite ADP is like the SP 30, which I have him around SP 15 and I'm hardly ever able to get him even at that point. But uh, I've, I've seen him go a lot later for other people, huge strikeout upside for both of these Tarek Skubal's my AL Cy Young pick. who was far and away the leader in XFIP and, or FIP regular FIP, probably XFIP too, an XERA. Mm -hmm. Um, among pitchers with 80 innings last year, just so much upside. And I think they'll be aces this year. Uh, mid round. Uh, let's see. Does Justin Steele count as mid round? I get a lot of him. I think yeah. I just think he's being undervalued. I think uh, Chris sale. is probably mid round. Chris Bassett. I like him as somebody who's really going to stabilize the ratios, get a lot of strikeouts just from the number of innings. He pitches a lot of wins. Uh, Mitch Keller, if you're looking to make up grounds and ground and strikeouts, I think there's a lot of room for improvement with the ERA. Uh, and uh, also Christian Javier. I'm not I'm not so quick to move on from him like everybody else is. I think he may be fixing things this spring. Um, Kodai Senga, too. I don't know if that's a mid-round pick, but I, I find I'm drafting him a lot at his discounted cost since he's missing the start of the season with injury. And so all those pitchers I just named, if you can get like four of those, I think you've got a really good start to a pitching staff. They're all ahead of the glob for me, so we haven't, we haven't gotten into the glob yet. You can get four of those if you can, you know, maybe even someone higher in than I've talked about than I was talking about, then I, I think you've got a really good start there for your pitching staff and can hopefully navigate the glob. Okay. Not have to rely on it too much. Uh, then do I need to go low here? Sure. Low end options, Nick Pavetta, the strikeout upside he showed after returning to the rotation in the second half last year, Christopher Sanchez, great walk rate, great ground ball rate strikeout started to pick up late last year. And of course, as the Phillies offense backing him, AJ puck, Big riser this spring. I think there's a lot of strikeout potential there for the Marlins. Nick Lodolo, a lot of strikeout potential for the Reds now that we know his leg's in the clear. Uh, since we did uh, the position previews, I'm I'm not quite as high on Eric Fetty as I was then because he hasn't been getting strikeouts this spring. But it is just spring, and um, I'm afraid I'm 
going to back off him, and then he will end up having a season just as impressive as they thought all along. So if you can get him around pick 225 near the end of your draft, I still think Eric Fetty for the uh, workload he's going to take on, and and hopefully those gains he he enjoyed in Korea will carry over. Chris, you are up. Favorite starting pitchers, early, mid, late? Um, I tend to draft a lot of everyone uh, early. It just kind of depends on when I decide to tip, dip my toe into the pool, but it's Pablo Lopez is probably my most drafted. Uh, I got a lot of Zach Eflin among the early pitchers as well. And then I like Logan Gilbert more than I expected. Um, I kind of think he's a really nice, just like boring safe option. Who's going to give you a bunch of innings in the middle rounds. Let, let me, let me ask you this without slowing it down too much. What distinguishes Logan Gilbert from Merrill Kelly? Maybe he'll have a tenth of a point lower in whip. Um, but they're both a little less than a strikeout per inning. Should eat a lot of innings, keep the ERA in the mid threes. You know, they and, and there's they're so far apart in drafts. I just I get I, Logan Gilbert as a four play as as a, as a floor play. Ayo. But yeah, <laughs> um, <after> dark. <laughs> but the, <laughs> but but I'm not sure the upside is that all that different from like a Merrill Kelly. Um, I think the upside is probably significantly higher for Logan Gilbert because he does have a lot of really interesting traits. He just hasn't been able to put them all together. Like he's got some of the best extension on his fastball of any pitcher in the league. He added the splitter last season. That was a really good swing and miss pitch for him. He just didn't take the big step forward as a strikeout pitcher. So it could be just a tweak in sequencing and, and, you know, figuring out how to throw the pitch a little better that could take a big step forward. But a big part of it is just ageism. I think that's that's a fair question. Okay, but Didn't one of them is one of them is thought I had when I was yeah. writing about overrated players yesterday. Yeah, one of them's twenty six and one of them's thirty four or whatever it is. You know, yeah. that's that's probably most of the answer. Um, as for the lower end guys or, or mid range guys, Dylan Cease, Hunter Green, uh, Joe Ryan, guys who I, I think the two of you are not nearly as excited about, but I think have lots of strikeout upside and. I if ERA is going to fluctuate as much as it does, let's chase up. Let's chase strikeouts. Um, lower on, it's kind of taking a hit because I was drafting a ton of Edward Cabrera. Uh, I, I'll throw Nick Lodolo there, Nestor Cortez. Um, I'm okay with Nick Pavetta. Ah, coming around, huh? Depends where he goes. I don't like okay. him as a breakout, but if he's cheap, uh, I still think Reed Detmers has breakout potential if he can solve his we very weird issues against lefties love gavin stone with one of my last picks aj puck uh and ryan weathers as sleepers as well my favorites to draft early on logan webb in the middle rounds bobby witt and later bobby on, miller what I, oh my gosh what is bobby, bobby witt has a strong a arm yeah i mean he his probably hits like picture might hit like 34 94 something like that yeah, yeah. I am losing it, man. We uh, we are we're doing a lot lately. We're doing a lot. Bobby Miller is the name that I was looking for as a, a mid round starting pitcher. He might even be a little bit higher than mid round. Uh, Shota Imanaga is yeah. someone who I like to target a little bit later on. He's on the rise. He had nine strikeouts here on Thursday, and it was nineteen in nine innings. Yeah. Wow. It was against the Oakland A's, but yeah. I mean, look, Bobby right. Witt Senior. Had 221 strikeouts in 222 innings in 1990. That's amazing, isn't it? That didn't happen in 1990. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. All right, go ahead. All right, let's wrap up with relief pitcher updates. The big news is obviously Devin Williams, who has three stress fractures in his back and will miss three months. Manager Pat Murphy sounds non-committal, but our guess is... Joel Piams, Joel Piams, if you ask Chris, maybe it's Abner Uribe, if you ask Scott. David Bednar has a lat injury and is nearing mound work. Not sure if he'll be ready for opening day. If he isn't, Aroldis Chapman is the next man up. Tanner Scott has looked awful this spring. I'm guessing he's still the closer, but perhaps with a shorter leash. Kenley Jansen is also dealing with lat soreness and is supposed to debut today when you are listening to this, Friday, March 15th. Despite the Angels signing Robert Stevenson, they've remained committed to Carlos Estevez as the closer for now. Stevenson is also dealing with a shoulder injury. And Scott, you read recently that Robert Suarez is likely to start as the Padres closer, right? Mm -hmm. 
There was a certain amount of hedging in within that article written by AJ Casavell of the the Padres website, but it 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 was both definitive and some hedging built in. So I, I've been drafting Robert Suarez as if he's the closer, and I'm drafting mm-hmm. him ahead of even like Jose Leclerc. Okay. Some sparps that are on the rise. Those are starting pitchers with relief pitcher eligibility, little cheat code in head to head points leagues. D.O. Hall, AJ Puck, Garrett Crochet, Jordan Hicks have looked uh, pretty good so far in the spring. Give me your favorite relievers to draft. Just give me names. We don't really need analysis. We got to wrap up. But uh, Chris, we'll start with you. Give me a closer. And if you have like a late round sparp you like, it's, it's probably AJ Puck, but go ahead. It is. There's a lot of sparps I like. Um, Cody Bradford. Mason, Cody Bradford. Yeah. Uh, Mason oh. Miller is not actually, actually, is he? No, he's not really for pitcher eligible. He's only SP eligible. He's, yeah, he's only SP. starting pitcher, but we'll gain. But he, yeah. I think he has a ton of upside if he becomes the A's closer. Ryan Kirkering uh, as a later guy who could become the Phillies closer. Higher up, I I think David Budnar has become a really nice value. I think I got him like 120th or 130th in today's draft. I think he's going to be ready, if not on opening day, very shortly after. So I'm not too concerned there. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Relievers I like to draft. I'm not that particular about the individual relievers. I just want the values. And Paul Seawald is often the last from the tier that I mm-hmm. am most likely to reach into the earliest. So Paul Seawald, I'm drafting him a lot. He's adding a changeup this spring great he doesn't need it but it can't <laughs> hurt exact, literally exactly what he said he said i don't want to brag but i don't actually need this pitch <laughs> yeah uh craig kimbrell i think is undervalued people are more afraid of him than they should be mm-hmm. so he's a nice value uh, kelly Hope- jansen for the same reasons of yeah I, I mean i like kimbrell more but yeah it's it's a similar situation jose alvarado i i, I think he's going to be the guy i'm not sure but i'm Confident enough that I'll I'll accept the discount. And then Robert Suarez and Jose Leclerc. I, I think they are I think they're safer. I think they're also safer in their roles than people are giving them credit for. All right. The closer I like to draft most is Rysel Iglesias. I do agree on Craig Kimbrell. It feels like he's undervalued. And uh I'm pretty much interested in all these sparps late, but yeah, like AJ Puck is, is really exciting mm-hmm. right now. Garrett Crochet, too. I I, I want to see more. He hasn't really, he hasn't really taken on that workload before, but it's looked pretty good so far here in the spring. We are going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning into fantasy baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we will be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.